Hello, Biological Anthropology Lecture students. Here it is, April Fool's Day, April 1st, 2020. Um, this uh, video is to sort of introduce your inner monkey, the last video, and that should appear right below this one, which you'll be watching this week. All right. Now, this video has a couple things I want to talk about. Uh, uh, it's fairly straightforward, except some things I need to mention. In the opening scene, you're going to be talking about, you know, what is a primate. So you'll see him in the trees, you know, going through all the primates, sort of the laundry list of what primates have, the habitats in which they are adapted for, which is the end branch niche. And I want you to catch up, uh, be very careful to pay attention to that for the next exam. The primates are designed to be out there at the edge of the trees and the end, at the end branch niche. Um, but more importantly, um, looking at the fossil evidence. So what he's going to do is he's going to go into see Jonathan Block, uh, who is a big primate uh, anthropologist, right? I mean, this is what he's done uh, in, in, to make his make his living, and he's uh, been excavating extinct primates um, in North America, uh, in Montana, and in Wyoming. And one of his fossil finds, what we're going to look at, is a genus uh, Northoctus. So he's going to be looking at a species Tenebrosus. So Northoctus Tenebrosus, right? Uh, now, this primate you're looking at is not a human ancestor. Um, this primate went extinct, and all of the primates that were living in North America went extinct. Now, this primate's around 50 to 53 million years of age, which makes it a U-primate or a true primate. So they're showing you this as a representative example of what an early primate, a true primate, would look like, right? And there were dozens of species and other genuses like this in the world at this time. Now, the ones in North America went extinct because the Grand de Coupour, which hit 34 million years ago, just 17 million or 20 million years after, you know, this was found, um, the primates sort of in North America had descending ice, you know, shields, or, you know, ice, ice coming down from the northern hemisphere, you know, locking them and trapping them into North America. And they couldn't go further south because there was no Central America at that point. And because of habitat disruption, food shortages and all sorts of other issues, all the primates in North America went extinct. Okay. The primates in which we're descended from are from Asia. They're from China. So just just remind yourself of that. You're looking at just some representation. All right. Now next, an um, uh, interesting part of the film too is is how uh, primates gain color vision. And if you've noticed that like things like dogs, right, mammals like dogs don't have color vision. They're black and white seers, right? or just blue-green at the most. They don't have, you know, rich trichromatic color like we do, right? Where we have the um, the the blues and the greens, right? Um, as well as the reds, right? Um, and think about this too, that reptiles don't have rich color vision, right? They're the black and white seers also. Um, so we're a very special line of mammal. I mean, we've acquired color vision. Um, but how we've done this and why we've done this is really not explained very well um, in uh, what Neil Shubin is going to discuss, okay? First of all, to give you some background. Now, the monkey that they're going to be looking at um, in, in the lab in Washington, uh, is, his name is Kramer, you know, and um, he is a New World monkey, okay? So New World monkeys in general, they just don't have color vision. You know, they only have two opsins. They only have two proteins in their eye, right, that absorb wavelengths, which are blues and, and greens, right? Or greens and yellows, right? They, they don't have the red uh, absorption protein, uh, the opsin that allows them to see the rich trichromatic vision. They're just, they're just double chromat, dual chromats, right? Now all old world monkeys, right? Which we've descended from have rich trichromatic vision, right? Trichromatic vision. We have three opsins, okay? So it's the story of how we've gained that opsin. Well, in the film, they gloss over how they treated cream and what they've done. They just said that they, they've taken this, you know, this old, this new real monkey. They've given it a third option. All of a sudden, ba bam he sees in, you know, rich trichromatic color. They actually don't just inject this into the eyes of Kramer. <laughs> what they do is they take Kramer's gametes, right? And they engineer the gametes by inserting the third option. And then they place the gametes into sexual reproduction, right? Artificial insemination. And then in the generation, the next generation, that next generation has a trichromatic vision. So you're, the monkey that you're seeing, the second one, is not actually Kramer. That's his actual descendants. I, I wish that they would explain that uh, in, in the film, okay? 
Now, what's important too is that yes, we 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 get this uh, uh, this trichromatic vision because um, we have three opsins in our eyes, right? Three opsins, right? Versus just two. Um, and they've given one extra one to the descendants of Kramer. Now, Neil Shubin says that about 23 million years ago, um, old world monkeys were able to, to get this because it gave them rich, you know, uh, ability to see in three colors, right? Uh, and it does, it, it immensely enriches the, the fabric, the textures of, of the tapestry of colors you have out there. And it does make finding ripe fruits, you know, far more easy, right? And it's a tremendous advantage uh, for primates at this time. Now, we have to think about, though, is why don't other animals have this ability? He doesn't discuss this, all right? It's like cats and dogs, right? They don't see in rich three-color vision like we do, and neither do any of the reptiles, right? So um, how is it that we've gained this? Now, one thing in the film they looked at, and they said the brain was somehow pre-wired to see all this coloring. All you got to do is put the third option in one of the gametes of Kramer, and the next generation somehow, bam, the brain is pre-wired to see the colors. Well, how the heck did that happen? They totally didn't say anything about this. Well, this is what happens. Think about fish. Are fish colorful? Well, that's sort of a rhetorical question. Well, of course, if you look at any tropical aquarium, you're going to see a, a gamut of colors. And believe me, those colors aren't for you to look at. It's for other fish to look at. You see, Fish see in rich color vision. In fact, they see in four different colors. They're tetrachromats, most of these fish. All, my, all the fish are tetrachromats, right? Well, when I think of what happened. So we have our intrepid fish that crawls out of the ocean, or the, the freshwater, actually, freshwater fish, Tiktaalik, um, and begins to move on shore. Okay, and he's a tetrachromat. He's got four color visions. And he gets up on land. And what color's on land? Green and brown. That's it. Any need for this fish to locate anything with color whatsoever? Does color vision have any purpose? Absolutely not. Tiktaalik and his kind, as they evolve into reptiles, lose the ability to see any color in general. Most of them do. Because it's not needed. It's like evolution is like that. It's use it or lose it. Right? But those genes were lost in the eyes. The ones that produce the opsin here. Not in the brain. The receptors in the brain were already pre-wired since they were fish to see in those 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 colors, right? So all you have to do is turn the opsins back on in the eyes, those genes on, and the brain's pre-wired because you have the brain of a fish. Well, I should, but you do. You have the brain of a fish, right? And now what's more important than that? I open the statement up as saying fish see in four different colors. Well, so shouldn't we? Some of us do. Women, ladies. 12% of you are tetrachromats, right? You see in four different colors. Yes, you do, right? Um, so it's actually possible. And men, you don't. And here's the reason why. The gene is a recessive gene, right? And it's carried on the X chromosome. So males, all we carry is an X and a Y. So we're always going to get the recessive gene. Thus, we'll never be able to see in four colors. But women, not so much. Because if you get a, if you carry the, the gene for the fourth opsin on the X and you have two X's and you have both of them, you have two recessive genes, one on each X, that means it will express themselves. So you will be a tetrachromat. And you can see this every once in a while in what's known as superseers. And you can have the superseers see this sort of strange, sort of weird ultraviolet sort of light. Um, and there are tests that actually verify that as well as the genetics, right? So I wanted to be aware of that also. All right. Now, the last part of the film that you're going to look at is when we start approaching the human fossil record. You know, this film this spans a tremendous length of time, you know, you know, literally 65 million years all the way up until the emergence of hominins. Ah, uh, that's a big stretch. Um, and you're going to see two major finds, right? One is sort of the iconic Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis. And that is a was found by John Don Johansson, the Grand the Pooh by himself, who's going to be exhibiting Lucy. Um, and I want you to think about some of the statements that he says, um, that when that fossil is laid out in front of you to look at, um, um, he refers to her, that fossil, as a person. It's a person. 
Now, in the scene after that, when they're sitting around the campfire and you're watching, you know, Lucy walking around, um, he says, it's just the chimp that stood up and walked without any philosophical glint in her eye, which says that she's a not a person. So you ask yourself, okay, Johansson, what is she? Is this a, a walking ape? Or is it something different? Is this thing adds some sort of personhood? Well, actually, we've got to tease that out and answer that question. And that's for next week. Now, what was Lucy? And I'm going to put this thought into you. That there's no way a chimp that could just stand up could have survived in the habitats that Lucy did. That is not a chimpanzee. And that's my argument. This is something completely different and, and behaviorally different. And we're going to be looking at how we know that. That's the mark of next week. Okay. Now, what happens after Australopithecus afarensis is we're going to look at an older find. And this is an earlier genus. Now, by the way, I should put this date from you. You're going to see it in the film that that uh, the genus Australopithecus and Lucy is around 3.2 to 3.4 million years of age. Australopithecus begins at roughly 3.9 to 4 million years ago and is around to about two and a half million years ago. It's a million and a half years that this genus was in play before the transition to the genus Homo. Now, previous to this, we have another genus of hominid, you know, walkers, known as Artipithecus. Now, we're going to be looking at the most recent Artipithecus, dated about 4.3 to 4.4 million years ago, um, and that's uh, Artipithecus ramidus. And it's not the earliest one. The earliest one is called Cadaba, and it goes back to at least 5 million years ago. Uh, the important thing to look at on this is the, the foot structure. You know, this doesn't have the foot like Lucy does, right? Lucy has an inline toe like us. This one has a divergent toe, right? You know, like a typical chimp or grade ape, right? And yet Don's, and, and, and sorry, that Tim White, the guy who actually found it, said this, this thing still walking in the, the, the habitats. I, I want you to ask yourself, how well was that thing really walking around, right? I mean, really, was it walking? Um, and exactly, what was this habitat like? No, Tim says it's a woodland, right? When he's finding parrots, you know, he's finding, you know, uh, tropical birds. He's finding, you know, tropical animals. You know, this is a tropical forest. But it's a tropical forest is different than what we imagine. A lot of times we'll think about, you know, the South American tropical forest, which can be on hilly, you know, hilly hillsides or African tropical forest, which you mean hilly hillsides. This is a lowland tropical forest, right? with lots of waterways running around it, right? With localized islands, with marshes. Because one thing that was actually found in the fossil record there was hippos. So there's marshes everywhere around it. So what do you ask yourself, before I even mention this next week, on like, what, if there were marshes around, right? And these things were living on the banks, these marshes and trees, why would they have a divergent toe, right? I mean, would they be walking actually on land or... What would they be doing in those marshes, perhaps? Let's, let's, let's give that a question, and I'll, I'll uh, give that uh, some thought. Um, and I'll bring up some lectures next. Uh, I'll, put, I'll post these on Sunday, by the way. Sort of follow up what you're looking at to give a better explanation. So we're going to go, by, uh, go beyond Tim White's vision of this to where we are thinking about how our first ancestors were walking and where they were walking at. Catch you guys next time.